Now we're going to talk to a strong progressive voice, recently selected as the top talk show host in Colorado, David Sirota. David, how are you? Hey, Jake, how you doing? Pretty good, pretty good. That's a cool honor. Who, who picked you as top talk show? Uh, it was 5280 Magazine, which is the big, uh, the big glossy magazine here in Colorado. All right, that's awesome. Okay, Thanks, so, man. Um, no problem. Uh, well, you did it. You're the one who got selected. So now uh, let's, let's, and by the way, Dave is on uh, KKZN AM 760 in Colorado. Um, so uh, let's talk about McChrystal. Uh, you got a bone to pick with why he got in trouble. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, well, I mean, the issue is this. You have to look at it on a, on a timetable. Seven months ago, uh, Stanley McChrystal was publicly campaigning uh, for a major Afghan war escalation uh, and helping fuel a Republican criticism that the President of the United States shouldn't have been taking uh, time uh, to do an Afghan war review. Uh, if you remember, there was that criticism that, oh, Obama was taking too much time to study all of our options. McChrystal gave a couple speeches, uh, leaked a report to the Washington Post, effectively to try to pressure Obama uh, to escalate the war. And that, I think, to a lot of people, uh, looked like a a challenge, I think, to the constitutional authority uh, of the president, and that really the principle that the president is the commander in chief and the military is the instrument of policy, not the maker of policy. The, the problem was is that seven months ago, when McChrystal did that, uh, there was very little uh, media outcry. Almost nobody talked uh, about uh, uh, saying that m that was a fireable offense, even though it, again, really went to the core of some of our most sacred constitutional principles. Now you cut seven months uh, into the future. And all of a sudden, it's a fireable offense that Stanley McChrystal has said a couple of not nice things about various uh, White House aides. Now, I don't mean to absolve McChrystal. I mean, he, what he said to Rolling Stone was outrageous. But when you step back and you ask what we consider a fireable offense and what we don't consider a, a fireable offense, when you look at our reaction to all of this, what you see is that for whatever reason, we don't seem to be bothered by generals uh, making unconstitutional affronts on the authority of the President of the United States. The only thing we seem to get really upset about, the only thing we seem to classify as a fireable offense, is when uh, a general says some not nice things about top White House officials. There's, there's a real problem in that disparity. Well, let alone the fact that McChrystal also apparently oversaw, uh, to a, we'll use the euphemism of detainee abuse in Iraq mm -hmm. in 2006, mm -hmm and uh, that he obviously doctored the Pat Tillman report. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you can fix reports and get promoted for that, uh, and lie on reports and get report, uh, promoted for that, but if you say a couple of nasty words, then you've got to go. So, yeah, and, and I think that, that's really the, the, the problem here. It's, it's, again, not to absolve McChrystal for what he said, but it's to ask the larger question about what we think is unacceptable and, and acceptable uh, in the relationship between the president uh, and the military. I mean, the, the fact is, is that it's almost predictable that McChrystal said what he said uh, in the sense that because he faced no real heat for uh, trying to dictate orders to the president of the United States seven months ago, he probably thought, look, I can get away with anything. I'm more important than the president of the United States. And and in that sense, I think, you know, clearly he, he, he now had to leave, uh, he was relieved of his command, but, but the hubris uh, that we allow military leaders to act with, in, by which we, we treat them as if they should be dictating orders to the civilian leadership, as opposed to the other way around, I think, is really the key problem here. I want to get back to McChrystal's motivation in just a second. But, you know, you make a good point in the article that you wrote about uh, Washington etiquette and... T tell us about that and what you think is the real crime in Washington, according to the Washington establishment. Well, the real crime is, 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 unfortunately, is you can do basically whatever you want to do. Uh, you can violate the Constitution. You can uh, behave in a way that is counter to various principles we hold dear or we're supposed to hold dear in, in the United States, as long as you are effectively nice to people. Uh, Pat Buchanan, for instance, is a great example of this. You talk to people who know Pat Buchanan, they say he is the loveliest guy, the nicest guy, such a such a, a, a polite person. Meanwhile, he publishes some of the most offensive, anti-Semitic, uh, really racially offensive kinds of pieces, and he's been able to maintain a career because he understands that the only thing that really disqualifies you from a job in Washington 
is if you violate uh, the basic terms of etiquette. It's the same thing with McChrystal. He, he was free to give orders to the President of the United States, run around pushing a, an, uh, an Afghan war escalation that has gone completely awry. That was perfectly fine. That wasn't a fireable offense. It only became a fireable offense when he, in the media, uh, said some not-so-nice things uh, about, uh, about uh, various figures in Washington. It's sort of the, it's sort of the old ethos of, of high school, right? The major thing that's, that's, that's bad to do in high school is to gossip or say something not nice about a, uh, somebody in, in another clique. David, you know, first of all, I think you're being a little unfair to Buchanan. I think uh, he was entirely right when he said the British and the Americans made Hitler do it. So I, I don't <laughs> right. see why you get offended by things like that. You're I talking mean, about Pat Buchanan, right? Yeah, yeah maybe I, I'm being a little too harsh. Yeah, well, yeah, about Pat Buchanan. Yeah, so I, I don't know what you're all emotional about. He's a swell guy. Um, so, no, but in all seriousness, um, what do you think is underlying that? Because, I mean, th that's a fascinating phenomenon that they don't, that our power establishment doesn't really care about substance at all, doesn't really care what you do as long as you're nice, they're nice to one another. What's, what's the underlying problem? Well, I think what, the, uh, what, what that is is that really Washington and our political system has become, and this is always a factor in any institution, but particularly now in Washington, the, it has become a very clubby place where party, even though on television it seems like the parties are always fighting, that, that really it is a, a one company. And in, in some cases, at least at the, at the interpersonal level, uh, in many cases, a, a one-party town. And it, politics is so personal uh, as it goes anyway that really these personal, interpersonal bonds are the thing that, that I think people see as most important in Washington. David, and, I think it's deeper than that. You know what I think? I think it's that everybody wants to protect the system, right? Because the system is what got them elected. The system is what got them rich. Whether they're politicians or news anchors, they love the system. And so they don't want somebody coming in here who's a rebel or who's going to throw a monkey wrench into the system. Well, I, let, me, let me add to that. I think, I think there's, there's definitely something to that. And I'll put it this way. I think there's something to the idea that if you play by the unwritten rules and you don't criticize certain things and you, you're, careful about, um, you're careful about these rules of etiquette, uh, it, it sort of ensures that you will not be criticized for the same things that you might be criticized for. In other words, somebody who, who, who speaks real truth to power and uh, is kind of is seen as the party pooper, and, and even further than that, somebody who's going to get everybody else in trouble. It, it, there's sort of a, 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 a tacit understanding there. Now, again, I don't really know how... That, that's a factor in certain things like campaign finance. Don't criticize where you get your money from because everybody's getting money from everybody. I don't, I don't see that necessarily playing out in the McChrystal situation uh, because I think there was a political opportunity for Democrats to question why McChrystal was trying to usurp the commander-in-chief's power seven months ago. They didn't do that, and I think that speaks to a deeper mythology. And this is a really important point, I think, that since the Vietnam War, and the, the message since the Vietnam War is that we lost the Vietnam War because politicians in Washington uh, messed with and were making tactical decisions on behalf of military leaders. And for 35 years we've been told that. And that has, I think, created this mythology that says that no party, no politician is allowed to question any military leader whatsoever. That, a mili that military leaders give orders to politicians, and that the best thing a politician can do is simply let the military leaders do exactly what they want. Remember, it was George Bush who kept saying, you know, I'm not going to, politicians in Washington are not going to dictate uh, orders uh, to military leaders, which of course is, is so antithetical to the very principle in our Constitution, which says one of the things in our democracy that makes us a great democracy is that it's the opposite way around. Civilian leadership is supposed to give orders to the military.